uh, I'm Tilly Degan, the Professor of Taxation Law at uh, Oxford University and one of the directors of the MSc in Taxation at Oxford uh, at the Faculty of Law. And my co-convener for the workshop, uh, for this workshop series is, is Ruth Mason, the Edwin S. Cohen Distinguished Professor of Law and Taxation at the University of Virginia and an affiliated faculty member of the Virginia Center for Tax Law. Now, the, the purpose of this workshop, uh, as many of you know by now, is, is to foster communication between tax scholars and, and non-tax scholars. And I think um, by now everybody is familiar with our format. Ruth and I invite a, a tax academic that we admire to choose a work for, discuss, uh, for discussion written by a non-tax academic that they admire. We then invite the author of the work to discuss it with us here online. All of our sessions are open to the public and, and uh, in order to find out uh, more about upcoming sessions, you can uh, join our mailing list or watch social media for our announcements. Um, so first, uh, I would like to introduce our commentator for, for today. Uh, Ruth and I are excited to, to have with us Miranda Stewart. Um, welcome, Miranda, to this workshop. Uh, Miranda Stewart is, is Professor of Law at the University of Melbourne Law School, where she is uh, Director of the Tax Group. She is also a Fellow at the Tax and Transfer Policy Institute at the Crawford School of Public Policy at the uh, Australian National University, where she has been the inaugural Director of the Institute from 2014 until 2017. Miranda has more than 25 years of research, practical and leadership experience in tax line policy in academia, government and the private sector. Uh, and both Ruth and myself are big fans of her scholarship, which spans a wide range of, of topics, including taxation of uh, large and small business entities, non, not for profits and individuals, international taxation, of course, and the role of tax in, in development, uh, reform processes and budget institutions, and the topic for today, uh, which is a, a big part of her scholarship, uh, gender equality in tax and transfer systems. Uh, it's perhaps especially important to, to note Miranda's enduring interest uh, in the resilience, legitimacy, and fairness of the tax system uh, to, to support uh, good government. Miranda is, is a co-editor and author of several books. I, we don't have the time to go over uh, all of them right now, but uh, let me just mention a few names. Uh, um, tax, social policy and gender, shem transactions, tax law and development, uh, debt and taxes, to name just a few. Miranda has many years um, uh, of experience both in Australia, but also uh, overseas. So among other things, she has been a visiting scholar at Christchurch, Oxford, and the Center of Business Taxation at the SAE Business School. And she's taught all over uh, New York University School of Law, Osgoode Hall uh, Law School, York University, and the University of uh, Florida. Uh, we're delighted that Miranda wanted to, to uh, join us today, and we're very thankful uh, for the fact that you wanted to discuss with us today the work of Martha Feynman, who is joining us today. Welcome, Martha. So Martha, I, I think, uh, perhaps needs no introduction, but uh, nevertheless, <laughs> I'll do the, the honors. Um, uh, Martha is, is a Robert uh, uh, W. Woodruff uh, professor at, uh, at Emory Law School. Uh, she is an internationally renowned scholar of law and society, uh, no doubt a leading authority on critical legal theory and feminist jurisprudence. Prior to jo joining Emory, uh, Martha taught at the University of Wisconsin, Columbia University, and Cornell Law School, um, where she held the, the Dorothea Clark Professorship, the first endowed chair in feminist jurisprudence in the US. And at Emory, um, Martha serves as the founding director of the Feminism and, and Legal Theory Project, as well as the Vulnerability and the Human Condition Initiative, which emerged from uh, that project. Uh, she has received numerous awards for her writing and teaching, including the prestigious uh, Calvin uh, Junior Prize uh, for work in, in the law and society tradition, the Ruth Bader Ginsburg Lifetime Achievement Award, and 
others. Uh, Mother scholarship leads and expands the boundaries of feminist jurisprudence. Of particular importance in her, uh, is her path-breaking uh, legal framework based on vulnerability theory, uh, which many of us uh, are familiar with. Uh, and that theory offers an alternative paradigm to a human rights appro approach to state responsibility and social justice. Uh, but today we will start with an earlier stage in, in Martha's uh, scholarship and focus on dependency. And hopefully if time allows, uh, perhaps we'll have some time to discuss some of the vulnerability uh, approach as well. Um, so Miranda has selected for us uh, for today a book chapter uh, by Martha entitled uh, Cracking the Foundational Myths, uh, Independence, Autonomy, and Self-Sufficiency. And we're very grateful that uh, uh, Martha has agreed to join us today to discuss it. Um, the paper, as you could see, points uh, uh, the, the spotlight to, to a topic of utmost importance, the reliance of the market um, on the provision of non-market services. It highlights dependency as a major feature of the human condition, as a universal and inevitable part of the human development, rather than being a pathological, avoidable result of individual uh, failings. Uh, the paper asks fundamental questions that I believe stand and, and should stand at the core of any discussion of tax law and policy, uh, importantly, how to properly value society's resources and how to fairly redistribute them. So welcome, Miranda and, and Martha. Uh, before we jump into the paper, I just wanted to, to note uh, uh, the format. So Miranda uh, uh, will start by uh, commenting on, on Martha's work. Martha uh, will respond, respond, and then Miranda and Martha will engage in, in, in some back and forth uh, uh, conversation. Uh, and depending on, this, on the time, Ruth and I may, may make some uh, remarks uh, to which Miranda and Martha, you are welcome to, to respond uh, before we open up the, the uh, conversation um, to, for the participants uh, to take part in it. Um, so participant, if you would like to, to be in the quake uh, please use the raise hand uh, function in your uh, Zoom uh, browser. Um, if you can't find it, just click on participants and then raise hand. I'm sure everybody is you know, fluent in, in Zoom terminology by now, but nevertheless. Uh, please uh, note that the session is recorded uh, and the first part before the Q&A may be posted on our website. Uh, which includes, by the way, all, our, all of our prior sessions. So you're welcome to, to check those out after today's session. Uh, also, uh, please, if you may, convey your name and institutional affiliation in the chat box so that we know who's here and so that we can share this information uh, with Marta and Miranda after the session. Um, and so without further ado, let me please turn things over to Miranda. Go ahead. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Tilly and Ruth. Um, uh, greetings, everybody from um, the other side of the world and also uh, a long way down south on the planet. Um, I, I had to put a, an artificial background up because uh, I'm in my office at 10 past 11 at night and everything is dark pretty much. So I thought I would show you a sunny picture of the Melbourne University campus. Um, it's really wonderful to, to see so many people here. I'm tremendously honoured that Martha agreed to join us. Uh, so I should say that. And I, I should also say congratulations to Silly and Ruth. This is really a wonderful uh, initiative, really interesting a series of, of conversations so far. My participation so far has been basically the recordings, <laughs> given, given the time zone issue. And I, I have to say, I, I can't see too many Australians here, I, but I do know there are a few uh, down under people who, who would like to see the recording, listen to the recording uh, as well. So you do have a more global impact, perhaps, um, than is obvious online. Um, so, yeah, so actually, just before I start, Silly, um, we sort of thought 15, 20 minutes, obviously I may take less than that initially even. Can I get a sense of how long we're going all together? Um, um, so we aim uh, at anywhere between an hour and an hour and a half. Um, 
but feel free to take your time. Yeah, okay, that's great. Okay, so um, let me take a, a step back uh, into why I, I had the had the the first choice uh, when when Silly and Ruth said, "Who might you like to talk to talk to, and whose work might you like to talk about?" Um, which is not tax, but but which has you know been inspirational and influential and. I have to say, Martha was actually my first, the thing that came to mind as I was sort of thinking through the, the audience, thinking through the kinds of issues we might want to address. And so I was really delighted that my first choice uh, not only was suitable for the, the event, but also that Martha was available uh, and interested. Um, so it, it's a bit of a, a, a step back uh, before I get right into the chapter that I've suggested people read. Uh, I'm sure there are some in the audience who've read much more uh, of Martha's, uh, Martha's work, but perhaps not everyone is, is so familiar with it. Um, it's a bit of a personal story as well. So um, if I take a step back to the 1990s, which is showing my age in that biography of uh, 25 years experience, I suspect that's now on the low side. I need to update the biography. There's a few more years in there now. Um, so in the late 1990s, I did graduate study at NYU. Uh, so I came over from Australia to the US. I, I met some, some of the folks uh, who are on this call sort of in that, in that time as well. Um, I was doing, you know, my international tax study, um, but I was also really exploring um, American legal scholarship more broadly, I, I guess, uh, not just through sort of formal coursework, but also building the research uh, projects I already had been coming out of legal practice and, and aiming for a, an academic career, I guess. Uh, and I had already done uh, some work on uh, feminist legal theory in Australia, uh, done some study and some uh, reading and writing in that area with Australian scholars. Um, uh, and one, one reason why that was that's interesting is that Australian feminist legal scholarship, obviously it, it covers a whole range of areas of law as it, as it does elsewhere in the world, but because of the design of our welfare state uh, and then on the revenue side, our tax system, there was a lot even in the 90s uh, and in the 80s and going back even earlier than that, there was already uh, quite a lot of feminist scholarship about the welfare state and about um, even about taxation in Australia. So, you know, there was some early scholarship in the US obviously on these issues and also in Canada um, that I'm familiar with. And these are the Anglo jurisdictions. Clearly things are happening in other jurisdictions and other languages that I, I'm not familiar with. Um, and there was actually a fair amount of cross fertilization also with the Nordic states. I see us there, very nice to see you. And um, Australian scholars were, were sort of learning from the, the Nordic, the, the feminist scholars in the Nordic states, especially in the way they were thinking about social welfare. Um, so, so I was sort of open to these ideas of, of uh, trying to understand those intersections when I was reading the American literature. And I was also very fortunate uh, you know, to have made those connections at NYU and otherwise in terms of um, the other kind of scholarship that was happening at those schools, not just tax, uh, and to have the opportunity to attend. Uh, I think I attended a couple. I remember one in particular at Cornell, uh, the Feminist Legal Theory workshops that, that Martha initiated. Um, so, so I think perhaps 1998 might have been when I attended. So I think they had been going for some time already uh, before that in various different guises. And so I met quite a lot of American scholars working on feminist theory and also queer theory and other critical, you know, critical sort of race theory that these things were being brought together in the workshops. And there were some other tax scholars in the US who were, who were using uh, this theory as well. Um, so that was very inspirational. Um, and it, it kind of also fed into some of my, a couple of my earlier publications, and I sort of keep coming back to this from time to time when I'm not thinking about BEPS <laughs> or, you know, other international tax stuff, um, is this relationship between gender equality, uh, family and care and dependency responsibilities. And so most recently I've come back into these questions again 
sort of thinking about it as a population-wide question, like a demographic issue, uh, in a sense, about aging populations and declining fertility and the distribution of responsibility for care, uh, you know, care and resources, I suppose, in the population. Um, so uh, I chose this uh, particular um, chapter because it seemed to me to be quite a, a, you know, a nice concise way of introducing some of these ideas which seem to be thematic uh, in Martha's work. So the chapter is from uh, this sort of book, Feminism Confronts Homo Economicus, which is, is, a, a, is a good kind of theme for, for tax lawyers, um, thinking about rational economic man, thinking about the, the way that uh, individuals behave in the market uh, and how that relates to how we think about uh, the family uh, and the state. Um, and, and so, you know, the whole book is a, an edited collection. Martha has one or two other pieces in there. There are obviously other scholars doing interesting work discussing those issues uh, and the development of, of those issues and that critique. And then this particular chapter, um, sorry, I'm just... Uh, wanting to get that up in front of me, cracking the foundational myths, independence, autonomy, and self-sufficiency. Um, so I might um, just highlight a couple, to sort of a few things in the chapter. I'm hoping that um, those in the room at least have been able to have that in front of you. Hopefully, if, if you haven't read it before, you had a chance to sort of uh, have a bit of a, a look at it. So, so it's from 2005, but to me, uh, it, it sort of summarizes and brings together some of the themes that I had encountered in Martha's work in, in the 1990s. Um, so it's sort of, a, a, Martha can correct me if I've misunderstood that, but the, uh, it seemed to me it to be that good summary. Um, so a couple of uh, interesting uh, aspects here, this issue of the situation of the care uh, giver, right? And, and the situation of, of, of women mostly characterized as homemakers, caregivers in that family and household. Uh, in, in feminist analysis or, you know, in our analysis about thinking about tax and the family or welfare in the family, we, it, it, it always seemed to me that the, that the carer slash mother sort of appears and disappears in the discourse, like is, is sometimes really visible. We, we sometimes we put that, that care kind of front and center as being the only thing or the main thing that, that, this, that this position, this, this role in the family does. And sometimes we don't see it at all because we just see the household as a, as a single unit. We don't see that that activity inside the household, or we only see the breadwinner. We only see it when it encounters the market in some sort of public way, uh, waged uh, way. So in this in this chapter, it seems to me Martha sort of asks, you know, interrogates that question, right, about how do we understand that that carer role, and how do we understand. Um, the person as an individual, physically the person in their relationship to others in the family, but also to the population as a whole, right? To the community or society through the state. Um, and so she's testing not only what is a carer and, and how do we think about that, but is it is it really a good idea, on the other hand, just to think of us as individuals, right? To, to kind of separate out that. Um, that difference is a bit, um, was a bit confrontational to me, I guess, because my, my sort of initial approach in terms of feminist theory and thinking about gender equality was, was to kind of require us to think of women as individuals, right? To separate out women from that relational role in the family and caregiving role. So what's interesting and challenging about Martha's work here and earlier is that she, she tests both propositions, both the proposition that you're always relational and caring and the proposition that you might always want to be an individual who's independent and should be characterized as a separate individual in the market uh, or in government policy. Um, it is interesting when I go back to this chapter, Martha, um, it's a few years since I had read it, um, uh, is that quite a lot of what what you say does sort of ring true now. So, you know, even just on in the first page on, on 179, um, 
you talk about the idea of the assumed family as an ideological construct, but with a particular population and a particular gendered form. Uh, and, and we could sort of apply that in, in any different context um, and today to think about what is the particular form it takes in a particular context. Um, if I just move uh, forward through the chapter uh, a little bit, uh, some of the, the headings that Martha uses really draw out these core themes in, in sort of feminist analysis, both of social welfare and of taxation. So the, the classic sort of dichotomy of the public and the private, um, and the again, the kind of complexity of that public and private that, um, you know, the family is perceived uh, really as, as private, we have this privatization of care. But then as Martha points out, um, and I think Silly has already mentioned as well, the market and the state uh, depend absolutely on that care in order for those public realms to function. Um, that is, it, it's, it's um, saying that it becomes private doesn't mean it disappears. It actually just, it becomes sort of the foundation for what then is constructed as, as public. Um, so two of the things that Martha does explicitly, and this brings us to the, the dependency um, idea in the paper, is first of all to highlight uh, I guess the, the, the reality of dependency for all of us. So this is the human condition, um, this idea that we all uh, are at different times in our lives dependent. Uh, and you could just say that the most simple level and rather than engaging with more complex kinds of dependency, Martha sort of points out, we can just say biological dependence and leave it at that uh, as a kind of starting point at least. Um, so we're all infants, uh, we all, or most of us, many of us get sick at different times, uh, get tired, we, you know, we, we have to sleep, uh, some of us get old. Um, and, and so we have this life course um, of, um, you know, moving in and out of states of being more or less dependent. Um, so, so there's that kind of life course idea of kind of primary dependence, if you like. Um, there's a much more general way, it seems to me, that Martha is talking about dependence here, uh, and that is that idea that in our societies, as we currently live in them and in our system, we are all fully dependent kind of on, on each other, on our governmental systems uh, and on our, the way that we construct our markets. We couldn't exist as humans without this sort of broader um, set of sort of social infrastructures, if you like, um, that they kind of construct us as, as humans. We can't live outside society. So this is not, a not, I mean, this is a point that law and society scholars make in, in many different ways in their work. Um, but it's, it's important, I think, to say that we're not dependent only in terms of our biological life and, and, and from infants and so on, which is the most obvious dependence, but we're also uh, a, a dependent for our very kind of conceptual uh, and kind of physical existence on this, this broader collective. Uh, another important thing uh, that I think Martha brings out here, which is really, of course, directly relevant to gender inequality, uh, driven by the fact that the women are most uh, do most of the care work uh, even today uh, in societies, both in the market, often underpaid, or uh, in the home, is this concept of derivative dependency. Uh, so to explicitly point out that the caretaker doing the labour is also dependent because they, because they are using their time and resources to care for others, that creates a derivative dependency. But that derivative dependency is something that should be a collective problem and not just an individual uh, problem. Uh, and so I, I think I haven't actually seen so much of that in, in other work, Martha, that the, to, to make that explicit that this dependency is derivative uh, or, or, or kind of, I mean, as you think of financial derivatives or mathematical, you know, the, derivation of stuff from the underlying biological dependency. 
Um, so Martha sort of moves through those uh, those concepts. You have that that heading of of um, derivative dependency, and, and you know the basic gender equality point is that uh, this is unjust, right? That we have this uh, unjust and excessive burden of care and dependency uh, that falls much more on women than men, but also we, we could observe on poor women, right? Or on women of color. So she sort of points out that there is this sort of much more complex set of um, disadvantage, right? That uh, results from this derivative dependency when the collective fails to step up to provide the needed resources for the caregiver. Um, and of course, she points out the foregone costs of the, the paid labor market and, and so on. Uh, and the fact that we need the resources for that caregiving. Um, a couple of other um, interesting things that I want to highlight, and then I might sort of stop with the, the narrative, because again, I think um, people have probably uh, looked at it. Um, the, 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 sub, the chapter has an interesting um, section on subsidy. Uh, it's, it's, it's an interesting way of thinking about the problem that um, we, you know, we think of that as sort of a financial subsidy or whether it's a tax concession, you know, a tax expenditure or whether it's a direct uh, payment. But again, that sense that in the collective, we are all subsidised now, right? Everybody lives subsidised lives. Um, and again, these are, these are ways of, of articulating the problem that, that I think are a bit unique to Martha and that are not the ways that I've seen in so many other, in other arenas. Um, in terms of the relationship to, to tax, of course, um, I, I won't talk so much about the, the, the independence uh, point, though that's also, there's a lot in this chapter, I think. Um, in the last part of the, the chapter, Martha, of course, talks about the idea of a more active state. So how do we then respond to both the primary dependency that we all have as part of the human condition over our life course and the derivative dependency that is a consequence of being, of having people who must be caregivers, right? Um, give being, uh, caretakers actually is a word that I think you use more, Martha. Um, and so what is the role of the welfare state or, or the, the system of allocation and distribution of resources, which is taxation and then payment uh, of, of payments out or else of for public goods? Um, the state must, to, to quote again from Martha, the state must use its regulatory and redistributive authority, right? The state is the legitimate uh, locus for collective decision-making. Uh, and it is its role to legitimately use that authority uh, to, to address the lack of resourcing of those especially who have derivative uh, dependence. Um, taxes and then Cash payments are obviously a very important way that states do do this. Uh, and in fact, modern states have become very good at it. It's not that they always choose to do it though, right? We don't always choose, but there are, we have a lot of techniques for doing this with financial distribution and also public goods. Um, so that's just very briefly on that particular reading. Uh, in terms of the way that I've used it, I'll just take a, a couple more minutes, I guess. Um, soon after I returned to Australia, I wrote a paper about uh, domestic, domesticating tax reform, uh, the family and tax and transfer law in Australia. Uh, and one of the things I, so I sort of looked at our income tax law and, and the tax unit and how that, um, appears to be individual based, appears to recognize us as individuals who, who have market uh, activity and income, but actually had embedded with it a, a whole range of ways in which women are, are um, embedded in this, in this household and in this hierarchical kind of breadwinner caretaker uh, di dynamic. Um, and, and some of the things that actually Australia's welfare state was doing were, were sort of radical and a bit different 
not, not to idealize them, right? We still had a conservative government. We still had lots of constraints on our welfare system, but the welfare system had a very strong focus on the parent child relationship as the most important relationship rather than the sexual family or breadwinner homemaker relationship. Um, and that contrasted quite strongly with the American welfare debates at the time, uh, the, the welfare reform in the mid nineties, reform so-called, um, which was really punitive uh, for, for low income single mothers in particular. Ironically, we had a conservative government in Australia in the, in the nineties and then the two thousands, which nonetheless did pay reasonable financial support to single mothers. Uh, because it focused on the parent-child relationship. So I was trying to sort of draw out these complexities, but I was really using Martha's uh, work from her, her earlier books on the family and then these sorts of ideas about dependency. Uh, for example, um, uh, the, the kind of aspirational statement, Martha, I argue that we leave our aspirations for the traditional family form behind and reimagine what should be our core family connection. So we're sort of drawing on that work. Uh, the last thing I'll say is uh, the most recent work I've been doing is a, a sort of big book about tax and government uh, and trying to think more collectively about, you know, what is the role of taxation in financing the state and, you know, going back again to Adam Smith and all these sort of canonical sources of tax theory. Um, and I, I found a quote that just reminds me of Martha's work that I do uh, sort of have as a sort of an epigraph in the book. It comes from, uh, I, I guess, a slightly less well-known uh, American economist. Um, I'm just trying to find it now as I'm, as I'm talking to you. Um, who, who uh, Colm was the name, uh, Gerhard Colm, C-O-L-M, uh, in the 1930s to 1950s in the U.S., uh, and uh, he, he said, the human ends of government are individual and collective at the same time. Uh, and this actually seems to me quite consistent with what Martha is doing. And so I'm sort of trying to, again, always unpack that intersection between tax law, focusing on us as individual market actors uh, and the collective sort of responsibility and how we use that system to raise finance for this kind of collective responsibility um, across the population. Uh, so look, I, I'm going to leave it there. It's silly as my introduction. I could obviously go on for hours, but I should stop because it's the middle of the night and, and I really would like to hear um, from Martha. So in terms of um, the development of it, um, Martha, I'm interested in your views about that and also to hear from you more about um, how you're still thinking about these ideas of, of dependency and how the project has evolved over time since my first encounters with it, I guess. Thanks, Miranda. Uh, Martha, the floor is yours. Well, I want to first thank everyone for um, having me here, and I, this was an unexpected invitation, so um, I'll get into that. But just a few initial um, responses to what Miranda began with. Um, I no longer uh, think about this as a gender project. In other words, what I've done as a feminist theorist is to leave behind the demographic aspects of feminism, the sex-based identity um, and move on to it, the larger gender implications here, not attached to sex, but rather social roles and functions. So it's about the politics of feminism, but not centering sex as central in understanding it as essentially a discrimination project. This is my current project is not a discrimination project, but rather a social justice project that doesn't require discrimination in order to mandate social response or, or state activity. So that's really important. Um, secondly, um, I question the continued utility and value of concepts such as equality, liberty, independence, and autonomy. 
um, that in fact those make no sense and lead to a certain logic that individualizes responsibility in a way that is inconsistent with uh, a justice um, justice project. So just in, in initial responses. So I, I've really moved well beyond, and perhaps we'll see that um, as as I speak further. Um, I also want to say that I am not a tax scholar. <laughs> and I want to make that very clear. So this is like alien territory for me in many ways. Uh, my interest in tax has been pretty much confined or limited to looking at the rhetorical and ideological role that the tax system as it's constructed plays in the United States today. So the ideological construct of the taxpayer serves as a reason for not providing a robust social welfare system. It, or more appropriately, he, provides the politically compelling justification for austerity measures. In other words, the taxpayer is here as this, this construct. Um, it is puzzling to me that wages or wealth are viewed as the property of this taxpayer produced by some magical market forces that are somehow unrelated to the legal, social, political, and institutional processes that actually produce and distribute value and wealth in society. Our theories and policies revolve around the individual Social context and social contributions are, obs are obscured or ignored in the way that we think about this and the taxpayer. Um, this early piece begins my quest to rethink the process whereby wealth and value are generated and distributed in society. And it focuses on the institution of the family and the social roles that are developed or have been developed within the family. Here, husband and wife or breadwinner and caretaker, um, more appropriately. Um, first the, is the idea that the family is not a natural entity, but a social and political construct with a specific assigned societal role and function. Importantly, the family is the way that we privatize dependency. In doing so, in privatizing the dependency of the child, the elderly, the ill, and so forth, we alleviate other societal institutions, particularly the market and the state, from responsibility in that regard. So they do not have to respond to, um, to dependency since the, it's privatized within the family. Uh, the second idea that I think is important is the, that dependency work or caretaking that takes place in the family is essentially societal preserving work. It is essential to the preservation and reproduction of society. It's necessary not only to the individual who's in need of care, but also essential to society itself, to the well-being of society itself. Caretaking produces the citizen, the worker, the entrepreneur, the taxpayer, and so on, upon which society and non-family institutions rely. So that's an important part of this argument. Third, that caretaking labor, the social identity of caretaker, caretaking, is unrecognized and unrewarded within this privatized family. So that the work that's done by someone performing this social role of caretaker is, um, is unrecognized and unrewarded. Um, this should be understood as creating a social debt. That labor should be understood as creating a social debt, a societal debt that is payable, owed and payable by the rest of us collectively, perhaps through the tax system, for example. In other words, this work should be compensated, recognized and compensated. And in making this argument, I drew an analogy to the military. So individuals in their roles as draftees or volunteers serve society as soldiers, our security as soldiers. But the resources they need to perform that vital role are provided collectively by society, by the 
politician and the taxpayer and through the personnel and institutions that comprise the military infrastructure. In other words, their derivative dependency on resources is provided collectively through these other social identities and institutional arrangements. The task of reproducing the next generation is no less essential. However, unlike the situation with the military, responsibility for and subsidy of that vital societal function has been privatized, assigned to the family and within the family to those of us who served in the gendered roles of wife and mother, at least at the time uh, I was thinking about them. So I argue that this is exploitive and unjust. The delegation of a vital social task should not mean the abdication of state or collective responsibility. Now, I wrote this original article in 1999, and I have further developed the ideas of dependency and the relationship between dependency and social institutions and the idea of collective responsibility since in that 20 some year, uh, 20 -some year period. Um, and the basic premise, I think, is that dependency that I begin with now is that our dependency arises from the biological and developmental realities of the human body. So that the place where we begin is with the ontological body, with the anthropological body, the universal body, not with these notions, these abstract ideas of consent, liberty, equality, and so forth. Now, <clears throat> reasoning from the realities of the body uh, and not from these abstract notions of liberty or, or equality brings into focus the necessity of social structures and our corresponding collective responsibility for those structures. It refocuses our critical analysis away from the individual to the institutional. Because we are fragile embodied beings, we are inevitably embedded beings dependent on institutions and social structures throughout our lives. The realities of the body necessitate that we live in societal relations. They provide us with the resilience necessary, not only to survive, but to thrive. For that reason, the body should be seen as both the origin and the justification for society and its institutions. The fragility and dependency that inevitably is engendered by the body are the reasons we create families, communities, governing bodies, and other institutional structures. Now, importantly, these structures that we create include more than just the family. They also, or we are also dependent on the institutions of market, finance, politics, as well as health, education, and social welfare systems. Significantly, these institutions are created through governing mechanisms using law and policies. They are creatures of law, shaped by family, corporate, contract, property, banking, employment, and other areas of law. They are also, incidentally, shaped by tax policy and law, and I want to come back to that in a bit. Um, these institutions are not inevitable in form, but influenced by history, culture, as well as power relations and politics. These institutions and relationships are mechanisms and distributions for the benefits of, of, and burdens of society. So they're mechanisms for the distribution of the benefits and burdens in society. Within them, individual complementary social identities are formed. Employer, employee, parent, child, shareholder, consumer, teacher, student, doctor, patient, and so forth. And these are often relationships of inevitable inequality. They serve different roles, complementary roles and function that are unequal, requiring unequal distribution of responsibility. 
These institutions and identities provide the background conditions, the infrastructure for the day-to-day -day lives of all of us, of every individual, as well as the economic, cultural, and political reproduction of society. We do not escape these institutions. We all live within them, they are mess embedded within them. They also serve as the mechanisms for production of wealth, value, subsidy, and support. These institutions allocate privilege and power, they distribute risk and reward, they confer recognition and structure accommodation, they are essential to the success or failure, not only of the individual, but of society. They are also interrelated, symbolically organized, so success in one affects our ability to succeed to succeed in the others. Success in the family affects our, in the educational system, affects our ability to, to prosper in the employment situation, which affects our finances, which affects our ability to form our own families, which affects, and so on and so on. These are symbiotically related. You cannot consider one institution without considering the others. Um, Tax affects everything, I have been told recently, <laughs> and I, I'm not disputing that, but I do wonder how tax fits into this framework. Can tax policy help to structure these primary institutions of distribution more justly? And if so, how? How can we use tax policy? What labor is un or, un un or undervalued within these institutions? Who con whose contribution within these institutions should count and how much? How can the tax system be used to build and sustain a vital social welfare system, a social welfare infrastructure that is valued as essential to the security of the nation, as is the armed forces, not something that is there if we have enough extra funds over and politics permit? Or the larger question, I guess, that I would like this group to consider, can tax policy be part of a larger social justice project? So thank you. Thanks, Martha. This was truly inspirational. So thank you for these comments. Um, so before we, uh, we open up for, for other comments, Miranda, would you like to uh, jump in here? Um, so I won't say too much, actually, because I think it would be really interesting to have the discussion in the group. Um, a, a couple of things to think about as I'm sort of going back and, and looking back at this paper again, Martha, as well as listening to your remarks. Um, one of the things I didn't highlight about the paper when I did sort of that initial dipping into it was was actually the political element. So one of the other interesting things Martha does yeah, under the heading, I think it is the responsive state, is you actually raise the question of how does one politically have the collective discussion, the public discussion needed to work out how to do this allocation of resources or this redistribution and um, subsidy, reshifting that subsidy, we, we could say perhaps. Um, and it does seem to me uh, that taxation is inherently, this is a political process as well as a social process. Uh, of course, we could say everything is political. So, so, so try to get, try to, trying to get away from that, right, that sort of relativism. There is something very uniquely and specifically political about taxation as a process. Uh, for um, re redistributing and, and reorganizing resources in society. And that makes it very frustrating. Uh, many of us in the room will, you know, the failure of tax reform, the challenges of vested interests, you know, the, 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 the kind of terrible de de fights in the public domain about taxation, right? So, so it's, there's a lot of negatives, if you like, of something that is so highly and explicitly political. But it also seems to me to be the saving, the important thing, or one of the really important things about taxation is that it is that political process. It might help. So one possible answer to your question, what's the role of tax in this process, it might give us a space for that political debate about resources. It's one way in which the society can have that, that political and democratic debate. Um, 
maybe I'm being too uh, Pollyanna-ish about this. I'd be interested in what other people in the room think or whether whether it's beyond hope, uh, the, the politics of taxation. So, 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 so that would be one comment, yeah. So I just wanted to respond to that a little bit. Um, you know, one of the things that I'm trying to do is to make us rethink the concept of redistribution. Um, so that when I talk about these institutions as being mechanisms of distribution, this is the primary mechanism of original di distribution. So it's through these institutions. Now, part of the crafting these institutions in the initial sense of it is thinking about the ways that they will or won't be subsidized by law and by society. So the corporation itself, the, the state subsidizes these institutions through their construction, giving them certain kinds of rights and, and obligations and, and so forth and so entitlements and so forth. Um, so that, you know, if we focus on that, then it doesn't take us to after the money has been distributed, do how do we redistribute it? Because I think that, that that's a loaded question in this uh -huh. particular political context. So if we focus instead on the many ways that the state is active in, the, in constructing and subsidizing and privileging these institutions, the employer versus the employee, the corporation versus the, um, you know, the consumer, whatever it is that look at these, com these comparative in, in the initial context. Um, so it's not a matter of redoing something, but how do we do it initially? And again, these are the mundane areas of law, corporation yeah. law, family law, employment law. How do we construct those? And what's the role of tax? Uh, and, and just the way that we think about these relationships um, for, for tax policy in that regard. Hmm. I, I think just one more comment, Silly, and then I'll turn over to you. I think that taxation, it's interesting that original idea, uh, one might argue that tax is kind of constitutive of the state. So it is a, a kind of constitutional form of law. Uh, it constructs our political institutions uh, in a real way. So I think you're, it's, I wouldn't think of taxation as just being about redistribution, although you're right that we often, we very often do talk about tax and welfare in that way, that we are redistributing something that's already. But, you know, there are many aspects of, of the way that taxation law constructs those relationships you've identified, employer, employee, you know, parent, child, and so on, that it, it constitutes those um, in an original way. So let's talk about it that way again. Rhetoric matters, framing matters. When we're talking about critical theory, all of it, you know, how we approach the questions, what questions we raise su suggests the answers to be provided in the way that we think about things. So I, I agree with you, but let's let's make that explicit. Hmm. Yeah. So Thank thanks for even silly. I think we should uh, open it up. That was great. Uh, so before I, I turn to, to Ruth uh, uh, for some questions, I, I wanted to, to try and take a shot at, at some of Martha's uh, questions at, at the very end of, of her uh, uh, comment. And uh, I, I want to note uh, two things. One is I completely agree with your uh, distinction between pre-distribution and redistribution. I think that's key. Uh, and I also agree with Miranda when she talked about the constitutive uh, um, you know, factor of taxation. Miranda was alluding to the constitutive uh, part that tax has in the state, but obviously, again, something that uh, she hinted at, uh, the, the tax system has a, a, a critical role in constituting the identity of taxpayers. And I don't think it's just uh, uh, rhetoric that we should look at. I think that the benefit of dealing with these issues of identity and of, of community uh, through the tax system is because tax has a bite to it, right? It, it doesn't stop at rhetorics. It also allocates real uh, resources. Um, and so what, I just want to give you a, 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 you know, a very, very uh, brief example of what do I mean by that. Um, so you, know, you mentioned two key concepts that I think are, are very uh, fundamental to tax. One is the taxpayer and the, the other is, is the market. So the taxpayer is again, something that the, the tax system draws heavily uh, on, but it, at the same time, it, it really constitutes, 
constitute what it means, right? So when we talk about a taxpayer, we usually talk about, we have some normative vision or version of what's a taxpayer. We talk about uh, a person that, um, for example, uh, lives by uh, her workplace, right? And hence commuting expenses between home and work are disallowed because they're, they're considered private rather than business uh, related. We also talk about the, the taxpayer as healthy and thus any uh, accommodation for disabilities or, or uh, exemptions for people with disabilities are considered a tax expenditure or a subsidy rather than something that should be looked at as you know, a, a natural part of the income producing uh, uh, process. And importantly for our purposes, something that Miranda and I have been writing uh, extensively about is childcare, right? So the normative taxpayer is, uh, doesn't have any caring responsibilities, right? And hence, having children is a private choice, and thus the expenses allocated to that private choice are private, rather than looking at it the other way around and saying, you know, I'm first and foremost a mother, and therefore, when I go to work, I have to incur some childcare costs, which are, which are part of my business uh, expenditures, right, and and there therefore should be deductible. So that that's just one uh, realm in which it could be relevant. But obviously, there are many other uh, realms in which uh, this identity feature of taxation is is highly relevant. Uh, and then about the market, I, I completely agree with your analysis, uh, which I found extremely important. That the, the the market is there's nothing natural about the market, right? Or you call it magical or the, you know, even the, the myth of the invisible hand of the, of the, of the market. And, and I think that's a key issue in tax policy because many of us tend to skip the first uh, or, or foundational part and, and treat our incomes or, or our wealth as ours, right? While, you know, if we really think very uh, seriously about that, uh, because the market is constructed by society, you know, and, and I'm a market person, you know, I fully support the market. I think this is one of the, the, the most ingenious uh, uh, institutions of, of society. And yet the very establishment of the market should not overlook the fact that it in itself allocates resources uh, in a very specific way. And tax has a major role in uh, con continuously reallocating those resources, right? So we talk about the progressive system as, as one uh, part of this, but I think you're absolutely right that we should look at, at other areas of our life and identities and communities as, as part of this reallocation mechanism that the tax should certainly be, be part of. So just, you know, if, first take it at, at that, and, and I'm sure others will have other uh, takes on, on, on your very interesting question. So uh, Ruth, um, would you like to come in here? Uh, yeah, so um, this discussion has been very rich, and I want to just take a step back and maybe point out some things that I've learned from it, and then, and then bring it back to tech. So um, Martha, in your work, I think, um, just in this conversation, you've highlighted a couple of things that I think are really important and not always intuitive. So one is this really interesting distinction that you're drawing between, for lack of a better term, mind and body, right? So you go back to luck, you know, uh, you know, back as far as you know political philosophy goes, right? So we own something by mixing our label, with our labor with it. This is a very individualistic, mind-based account, um, and you're saying. Well, no, we need to function, focus on the body. And once we do, we realize that there's all this dependency and then all of these obligations arise out of the dependency. Um, the other um, thing that you're focusing on is, so I think the body, you can't get away from the body. Who can resist you? The body matters. People um, do. The, <laughs> people do, okay. But, 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 but there's another aspect uh, sort of, of an, another premise of your argument that I think um, is easier to resist in part. And that's the idea that we should perpetuate society, right? Um, and so if you take a radically individualistic approach, maybe you don't need to perpetuate society. Maybe we don't, we can, that is, 
if you look at demographic trends and we see um, the carers, right, then those who have been assigned the role of caring, jettisoning the part of caring that's, it, that it's possible to jettison, right? They're not, people aren't getting married. People aren't having children, right? Birth rates are falling. Marriage rates are falling. Um, it, it is, does your work uh, mean that we should be fighting those trends um, and encouraging, um, encouraging more, you know, natalist policies, for example? And so, that, so that's a, a question. Um, and then just to, you know, we've got so many issues out on the table now, but I want to get out one more. So, you know, you have this public-private distinction, and you say that we, we relegate caregiving responsibilities to the private sphere, um, and that's a social choice that has profound effects because then those responsibilities get re-delegated within the private sphere um, to uh, mostly women, right? Um, and, that, and that women get impressed, so socially impressed, uh, into uncompensated labor, this saps their energy, um, it takes them out of marketplace activities, it permanently reduces their sweat equity and makes them, you know, in your terms, derivatively dependent. Um, I'm, I'm sympathetic to this account. I think, you know, it's a real credit to you and the other feminist legal scholars uh, that what seemed like a radical idea at the time that you wrote it now seems like, like an idea about which there's widespread consensus. Um, but I want to think about this public-private distinction. Um, and this touches too on, on Miranda's points about the individual versus the collective. Um, and, you know, the public-private distinction is, I don't, I don't think you view that as it's self-constructed. Um, so it, it, the, the problem with a delegation to the private isn't that the, the, isn't that the private sphere doesn't exist, right? It's, it's just that within the private, you get a redelegation. Is that, is that? It's not how I would think about it. Can, so okay. I, I could take your, your various points here. Let me see if I can remember what they were. First of all, the notion of the libertarian's response. Um, even libertarians, even Hobbes, <laughs> believed that you needed the state to perform some functions, right? Because there could be threats to the individual um, if, in fact, there weren't collective responses, security responses, for example. Um, even a libertarian would know in order to in enforce the sacrosanct contract or protect property, you need state mechanisms, you need courts, you need police, you need so forth and so on. So what I want to suggest is that that same security level is, uh, is also evident when we're talking about having an infrastructure that really recognizes um, the, the social reproduction of society. So if you don't have a new generation, you won't have the, the individuals to fill the employment. I and we face this. I mean, we solve this in part in the United States by immigration. So you bring people, but you need to reproduce society. You need to reproduce the work, working force. You need to reproduce the care, the people who are going to care for us in our old age. You need to reproduce society, you know, these social actors, the doctors, the educators, the so forth and so on. So if society doesn't do that, it will fail. And that's what happens to societies. And then we'll be, you know, the proud boys will take over and, you know, all sorts of things like that. So I think that it's, it's useful to think about, again, the work that is done by this ideological rhetoric of individualism, which is nonsense to begin with, which brings me to the point too, I do not believe that the private public sector is natural or inevitable. I think it's totally constructed. Um, and I think that, you know, again, it's done by the state delegating what are essentially social reproductive functions to various mediating institutions, be they the, work the workplace or the family or the educational system or, you know, whatever it is. Um, and at best, what we have are quasi-private institutions. Um, but the question that I would ask is if we're talking about an essentially state function, the reproduction of society, whose values or what values are going to operate in the in the in this this institution that's being created as quote 
private. I mean, this, this question arises in the prison context, in the educational context, um, more and more in, in, in just daily life. When we privatize or say, okay, we're turning this over to individuals rather than to the collective, what values then? Is it the profit motive? Is it efficiency? Or do we actually care about things like equitable distribution and justice and so forth and so on? So I, I do think that that's, um, you, you, that's there. The other thing, um, the social identities part of this is extremely important because again, these social identities, I would place them outside of the traditional way that we think about identities in the context of discrimination. So the problem with caretaking within the family is not that it's assigned to women. So the family has a social role and that affects, the social role assigned to the family naturally affects the, the, the social identities within the family. So the family's responsibilities are going to affect what those social roles within the family are. But caretaking is the problem. It's not the identity of the caretaker, whether they're a male or female or otherwise, but rather that the rest of the, our society, the other institutions don't recognize and accommodate and respond to the needs of the caretaker. And it doesn't really depend on whether that caretaker is male or female. Mm -hmm. And again, I think it's really important to deal with these social identities, employer, employee, parent, child, um, taxpayer, beneficiary, whatever those are, uh, it's really important to do with that because it moves us away from the this concept of, oh, that's discrimination on the basis of sex, for example. So the solution then is, oh, let's make it equal because these relationships quite often are not and should not be equal relationships. There is no equality that between parent and child. There's no equality between doctor and patient. I mean, we pretend there is, but what that does is to actually obscure what should be unequal allocations of responsibility. Who has access to institutional resources? Who, ha who has better knowledge? Who's better prepared to deal with this? What should be their responsibility then in dealing with the other? Um, so it, it, it just puts us on a totally different footing in regard to the way that we're going to shape these institutions and the identities within them. I don't know if that responds to all your questions. That was that was great. And I think we have quite quite a healthy queue now. So I want to make sure others get a chance. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. So let me uh, move uh, or open the floor to, to others. Uh, Hayden, also known as John Vela. Uh, <laughs> uh, I guess you're joining from uh, John's uh, computer. So please. <laughs> Not quite sure how that happened. Thank you very much. This has been fantastic. I have really enjoyed it. Um, something that you said remind the comments you were making about changing the language and rhetoric around redistribution really reminded me of at least my take on the myth of ownership, the book by Nagel and Murphy, um, and kind of making this argument that the idea of pre-tax income is an irrelevant moral category. Uh, and so when we're really thinking about the kind of justice outcomes, we should be focusing on what happens after tax. And then really the movement from pre-tax to after tax is not a particularly morally relevant one. Um, and I think that ties in quite closely to this idea of, you know, it's not like this distribution and then we're redistributing through uh, taxes and subsidies. It's kind of all constitutive of the outcome. Uh, but I also think that points to the, to the essential problem about trying to change the rhetoric, which is that tax by its nature goes from pre-tax to post-tax. Uh, and so trying to speak about that process in a way that uh, really kind of uh, shifts the rhetoric is difficult beyond just focusing on how the outcomes change at the end of the day. You know, are we making uh, carers better off or are we making them worse off compared to where they are uh, now? Thanks. I, I, I might just jump in there. I'm sure, Martha, you've got, but the, it's a, so the myth of ownership, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Liam Murphy and Thomas Nagel's book, but that might be something of interest to you, Martha, if you wanted to explore some of the tax stuff. The interesting thing that I think about that, and it does have a relationship back to my comments about tax, at, at, it's silly saying tax has an edge to it, and my comments about tax as a, as a highly political sort of set of acts and processes, is that um, 
I agree with you, we should be thinking about these broader institutions, but we also have to work with what mechanisms and processes we have in society and tax being one of those. And the reality is that if you do not acknowledge that people think of their income as their own, if we could put it that way, you know, that their own property or their own, you fail to see the way people change their behavior in the tax system. So the reality is that, that people do change their, pre, their, their taxable income because they change their behavior, they tax plan, they tax avoid. In order to do that, they have to start with something that in law is pre-tax income, is something gross, something that the market generates. Uh, and so uh, this is both an advantage and a disadvantage of thinking in a tax law frame is that you actually, you, the advantage is you get to look at how people actually can behave and change and manipulate uh, their pre and post-tax outcomes, which is real resources as they hit the road, who gets what resources and how. Um, so that's an advantage, but I'll, I'll leave you to uh, go on down the queue, I guess. So <laughs> Just can I say one thing about that? I, I, it's always it's of interest to me, and this is a United States perspective, that, that we readily accept, or at least for the most part, the idea of minimum wage, but not the idea of maximum wage, for example, um, which I think is you know a place to start. But also, uh, what what counts as a debit and what counts as a credit? What counts as a, a, a cost? And, and when we think about things like deductions, so why is your labor force? viewed as, you know, an expense rather than an asset. Um, you know, I think that there's, you know, again, just different ways of thinking about things. But, but mostly what's required is not just focusing on tax law itself, but the way the tax policy also shapes the way we think about the corporation, the way we think about the employment relationship. So it, it comes into play in many different ways, not just, you know, on the, on the tax policy itself. So. Absolutely. Um, Andy. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you to you both. This is really wonderful. And I particularly enjoyed the chapter um, that uh, Miranda assigned. I, uh, it gave me a lot to think about. I, I was struck by the same thing I think Ruth was, and I wanted to hear, I think, a little bit more um, uh, about that. The grounding the collectivization of caretaking responsibilities and sort of social reproduction. And it made me wonder just along Ruth's lines, like how far, how much that, that gets you. So it seems intuitive enough that child care, you know, can be justified on that basis. But you could, I, I think, pretty easily imagine a society that doesn't take very much care of the elderly at all. And that might be immoral and terrible and it might be a cruel society, but it certainly wouldn't cause society to collapse and you could sort of infill with immigrants, right? Um, and so in a world where people cross borders, I was wondering how many of these caretaking responsibilities you think can be collectivized on the basis of social reproduction. It wasn't obvious to me that that, that many could. Yeah, I, again, I, I don't want to focus just on caretaking. I, again, the theory begins with the family as the institution where it's most evident that we are dependent on care from others. And that's what we're dependent upon. But it doesn't end there. And, and again, that's why it encompasses, the theory now encompasses all institutions. So also essential to the reproduction of society is a healthy population. So that is the healthcare system. We have to have an educated population. Um, and in fact, one of the stunning statistics that I recently read in the United States is that more than half of the adult population in the United States cannot read and comprehend on a sixth grade level. What does that mean for the politics? What does that mean for the ability of our citizens to process complex information about things like COVID? <laughs> or the environmental crisis? And what are, what are the implications from that inability for the success the future success of our society. You know, so it's all of these institutions, our employment system, we rely on to distribute benefits, um, not only wages, but also access to healthcare, um, feelings of, of worth and dignity. I mean, what happens when our employment system is not functioning very well? So, you know, again, 
the, the initial piece 23 years ago <laughs> focused on the family, but we have to think about all of these institutions in that context. All of these institutions um, actually are integral parts of the reproduction of society um, and they have a role to play. And if they don't function, then society is going to suffer. So you can say, so what? Um, Great, you know, I can always move to New Zealand or something, but you know, that's really not good for everybody. No, you can't, the, but the border is closed. <laughs> <laughs> good for you. <laughs> no, no, well, in Australia, we reopen, so you can come here, but <laughs> sorry, I'm interrupting. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, Ted, Sito? Um, can I just make one? Sorry, oh, sure. I'm very sorry. No, I'm keen to. No, I'm keen to hear from uh, you. Sorry, sorry about that. But just to come back to your age care point there that you, that you raised, uh, Andy, and I'm, I am thinking quite a lot about this issue of fertility decline. Ruth mentioned it as well. I mean, in some countries, it's much more extreme than in others. You know, Korea, the Korea, the 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 the, the fertility rate is you know 0.9. Um, uh, in Australia, it's 1.6, which is considerably lower than even predicted five years ago, more like 1.9. These are all below replacement. I mean, countries like Australia and the US are strong migration, net migration countries, but actually the world over, right, we have fertility decline. It is kind of quite an interesting existential question to me about how much society cares actually about reproducing society. I, 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 like, I don't think that's just... A libertarian question and I do believe quite strongly that taxation has a really actually a really important role to play in that reproduction of society that it's one of the ways in which we collectively commit to that um, and so then I worry if you know the tax system becomes less resilient as well so so I do think these things are connected and, and the demography stuff is is quite quite challenging it's that the family stuff writ large if you like across the population uh, sorry, but please go ahead, uh, Theodore. Yeah, thank you. Ted, please. Sure. So I wanted to uh, wanted to um, uh, follow up on what I thought was one of Martha's most important comments, which is that the way that we talk about these issues really, really matters. And I'm going to speak here from an American perspective. I, I'm not as familiar with how these conversations go on in Australia or, uh, or let's say, the EU. But here, the way we talk about child rearing uh, is very, very heavily, in, in tax, is very, very heavily influenced by the way economists talk about it. And economists, interestingly enough, most of them are male, treat um, childcare as leisure. It's not labor. So they distinguish between labor and leisure. Labor is good, but leisure is not so good because it doesn't increase GDP. And childcare is leisure. Uh, this uh, uh, then is a corollary, which Philly uh, really referred to a little bit earlier, which is childcare is treated as consumption. It's not treated as productive at all. And you see this in the American system, for example, in the EITC, uh, the Earned Income Tax Credit, which is our principal, uh, principal safety net. Uh, in order to get the EITC, you must do something productive. You must work. Uh, and what counts as work? Well, childcare does not count as productive or as work uh, in our system. Uh, so the, 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 the vocabulary that we've adopted from economists have, has really serious implications uh, in the policies that we currently implement on the ground. I, I uh, published an article uh, some time ago, uh, uh, sort of focusing in on this, uh, and it was called, uh, Does the Income Tax cause parents to spend too much time with their children. Uh, because that is the assumption underlying, for example, James Mearley's analysis. Mearley's, who is a you know, very progressive kind of guy, um, categorized childcare as leisure. And, and one of the concerns that underlay, uh, that, that, that underlie his, uh, that, that, that founds his analysis of optimal tax rates was that if we tax people too much, they will go and do things like, for example, take care of their children, which is, according to economists, not a good thing. Uh, so uh, again, we, we need to find ways, I think, of reframing the economic foundation of our analysis in ways that are more consistent with treating uh, childcare as a societal, uh, a societal process, not just an 
an individual consumption process. Thank you. Uh, we have two more um, people on the line, and I was wondering whether uh, you would like to short, to very briefly refer to, reply to, to Ted, uh, and then maybe we can take uh, Asa and, and uh, Sandy's questions uh, combined. Would this be a good idea? Are, are you talking to me? Yeah, Martha and Miranda, would yeah. you like to, to briefly? Go ahead, Martha, yeah. I was just going to say, I recently have started to ask my students to imagine what our, our social policy would look like and our institutions and law would look like if we started from the presumption that everything should begin with the best interests of the child. Um, how would we, in fact, construct our social institutions with, with that. And it's, it's produced a lot of really interesting things. So that comment reminded me um, actually of that, so, you know, again, the framing, the value, what, what's presented first, which, are, which both defines what, what we focus on, both uh, defines the problem, the questions we ask and the solutions that we seek. So if we begin with the frame of independence, autonomy, blah, 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 uh, that's one thing. If we begin rather with the body and dependency and, you know, again, that different kinds of, of questions are asked and different kinds of answers suggest themselves. So um, I, I'm going to look at uh, Theodore's, um, look up Theodore's paper. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah well, that's right. There is a quick, uh, so, so one, um, one way that uh, I suppose some feminist scholars have started to respond to the, 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 the child care as consumption, you know, that, that analysis you had is actually to re-describe it as, as investment. So this is a bit like Martha, re, re, redefining, you know, the, the expensing of labor with labor as an asset, right? To, to, to start to sort of recharacterize that. And the, the sort of demographic fertility story is part of that, you know, that idea of investment in, in the future. I'm not sure how successful uh, we've been. There's some people, advocates here in Australia have, have also been adopting that word infrastructure, you know, social infrastructure. Uh, so instead of we're just talking about roads and bridges, we're also, of course, talking about kids, you know, that sort of thing. Thanks. I have a ton of commodification questions, but then uh, I'm going to turn to uh, Asa. Thanks for joining us, please. Um, thank you for a very interesting discussion. And uh, it's uh, good that um, what, I, what I see in your work, Martha, is that you communicate with a lot of other <laughs> Uh, sciences. I mean, you take uh, you. you this is a discussion if you work cross disciplinary, uh, with, with economists, with sociologists, with 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 those in in, in politics. Uh, this is the fundament where you 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 discuss the problems about gender equality, inequality, and why uh, and what is the the kind of basis of what is what is what is capture women in poverty in in subordination in all all types of uh, sectors in society um so so what I, what i want to say something i mean we 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 reach out to these questions from our different uh, legal cultures um uh, and and we kind of get trapped in 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 um, and we get onto different positions because, of course, in Sweden, we really have decided about the parental leave insurance that it is really resource the care caregiving in the traditional family. Um, but but that is just one little thing, and it can easily be changed with a new government and so on. But I think that that that, that our responsibility here is to to be a part of changing the narrative and there I also agree with Ted that that is that is as I've been doing this uh, gender and taxation and uh, for a long time now I mean you 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 there is hope I mean you're eating uh, you, you, slowly you are eating your into the and reach out to those uh, institutions that you never thought would raise these question, questions at all, like the IMF, uh, the OECD, and so on. And, and rather, rather conservative co organizations like the European Association of Tax Law professors are seems to be forced now to take up the task about gender and taxation. But uh, so, so of course, one way of, of change of, of finding a kind of base, I think. 
take it out to 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 kind of concentrate on what would be the children's perspective you could also think about uh, the human rights perspective because there there are some kind of uh, fundaments of what we think is a civil society uh, and it has been a bit modernized now or kind of updated in relation to the pandemic and of course also when we now are on the brink to a third world war there is like um, human rights needs to be as more uh, substantive to kind of change the playing field because we know that if women kind of the women the women's work like the caregiving will continue to be low valued in monetary terms and not a part of the public narrative i mean then we just going to be more and more poor. We, we go, it's not going to be a society for, for, um, for the future. It's not going to be a sustainable future, future at all. So, so that is something that is come into the, that's there you have an opening in the tax, um, uh, tax policy narrative and, and maybe you can change the playing field who has the power over the narrative. That is a very big question now. Uh, in the world. So that's Thank my you. comment. Thanks. If that's okay, I'll turn to Sandy Friedman now and then I'll uh, give uh, the floor to back to Marta and Miranda. Sandy, please, thanks for joining us. Um, yes, um, thanks so much um, for convening this great event. And I'm, I've just been so fascinated to hear this discussion, also not being a tax lawyer, but coming at this from many, you know, from decades now of work on the way in which um, care, caregiving, caretaking for women uh, affects their role in the family and their role in, in the labor market, um, coming at it from a feminist perspective. So I, I was particularly um, interested in, in your point, Martha, about the need for caretakers to have the resources to, have, to do their caretaking. But what I, I want to know now, my question is about um, the, the COVID pandemic and the climate emergency, which has blown open the family as an institution where work migrated back into the family, childcare and all other kinds of caretaking. And uh, from the data that we see, it's still the women who do most of that caretaking, but on the other side, paid caretaking, caregivers, have um, been on the one hand even more important but on the other hand even less valued both in terms of their own health and the kind of pay that that they got during the pandemic so my question with that plus the climate emergency is it's more and more clear that caretaking is a collective responsibility we could not get through the pandemic or in principle at least, or the climate emergency without us all taking care of the environment, taking care of each other's health, taking care of the future of the planet. And yet at the same time, the market rhetoric and the overwhelming um, ideology of the market is in a way even more salient um, in, at, at this particular point. So. You know, I, I, I'm glad to hear, Asa, that there is some hope, but on the other hand, I think these two, in a way, this period that we're going through has polarized, has, has on the one hand shown the importance of care, on the other hand, even more, the lack of uh, valuing of care and caretaking in, in all these ways. So I just wondered how you think we could change, really genuinely change the discourse when at this moment, of all moments, um, so little about the discourse has been changed. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Martha, can we start with you, please? You're muted, I'm afraid. Sorry. I'm, I, I was saying, I, I want to 
actually combine the two comments in a way and make this as short as possible. I am deeply suspicious of a human rights discourse solving our problems. It's highly individualistic. Um, it, it really focuses on the relationship between the state and the individual. And I think what we have to do is to rather focus, I mean, although there's loads of concern, that's all constitutional law and all this. Again, we have to focus not only on that, but primarily on what is it, how do these institutions shape the relationship we have as with individuals with each other? And again, these are the day-to-day -day relationships within these social identities that we really have to focus on. And this isn't a matter of human rights. This is a matter, again, of employment law, contract law, family law, these mundane areas that are not resolvable by these grand principles like rights and equality and so forth and so on. Um, and then back to the, the question of COVID. I, I, I've been doing some work and I'll be glad to share it on the COVID crisis. But one of the th problems with COVID is in fact that the way it's been presented by public health people is to individualize and compartmentalize the problems with COVID, to talk about specific populations as particularly vulnerable and susceptible to COVID, which in fact removes the whole idea of the collective impact. So that's one thing. And I, you know, I think that that's problematic. And what, where it's actually ended, ended up is within individuals then asserting their rights to go without masks or their rights to not be vaccinated or their, you know, again, the rights paradigm, the individual against the collective need, particularly when the collective is defined in this fragmented way as only some populations, you know, again, bringing it into this discrimination context. Um, I think the other thing about COVID that if we look at it as a positive is that one of the things that it shows us is in fact that our system of valuing of, of contributions by workers is really seriously flawed. So the essential worker, I mean, we have to rethink who is essential workers in the context of COVID. The, the supermarket personnel, the person who puts the goods on, you know, the truck driver who delivers the good, these are essential workers in the context of COVID. And we haven't even begun to integrate the, those realizations um, into, into the way that we think about, again, how we value things in, in society whose labor, whose contributions are rewarded and whose are facilitated, whose are supported, accommodated. And we really have to begin to, to, to again, rethink these fundamental relationships. Thanks so much. Uh, so Miranda, uh, before we let you, uh, you know, uh, go, go sleep, get some sleep, would you please, uh, give us some concluding remarks and answers to Asa and Sandy. Thank you, Zilli. I'm, I'm conscious that it's, it's in my part of the world, it's 12.34 a.m. I'm actually wide awake. It's been a, a very exciting conversation. Um, I, I can see Hayden's laughing because he knows what it's like to be at this side of the world and then the other side of the world um, and online in the middle of the night. Um, so I will be will be brief. Um, I've just put into the chat, I'll just send it, um, the quote that I said from Gerhard Kolm from this paper from 1936 uh, that I that I use in, in 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 my recent book because I was just reminded of it again from Martha's comment about COVID somehow being pitting the individual against the collective and and perhaps Sandy's comments about the. The negative, or you know, the the the, the battle that appears, uh, as well as uh, the optimistic idea, and to to kind of continually insist that 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 the human ends of government are individual and collective at the same time that we are we are always both of, of these things in this collective, and and I do you know again to kind of come back to Martha's question about what is the role of tax policy or how can we think about it? There's lots of different ways and. Certainly, it's so his work on the the commodification role of tax actually in relation to the market is in constituting us as consumers or workers or, or so on is important. But it does seem to me that the taxation does connect the individual and the collective. It's one of our legal and and political processes that that forces that connection, and that's why it's so uncomfortable 
right? That's why people don't like it. That's why it's always challenging to change. So that's also its promise, I suppose. Um, and then just to go back into your chapter as a kind of final uh, comment on this idea of language and using different language and different um, framing to kind of switch the debate around, which I think is a lot of what Martha's work does. It, it kind of inspires because, because you, you turn those assumptions around. Um, so your language of subsidy, so you do have a sentence at page 186 in that chapter. Of course, we think of subsidy as you know, transfers or tax concessions or whatever that, 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 or sometimes market benefits or something but you have that language subsidy, the subsidy provided by the uncompensated labor of others in caring for us and our dependency needs. So the caretakers are subsidizing us, right? The rest of us who are healthy, active market participants and taxpayers, right? The caretakers are subsidizing the taxpayers, not the reverse. Uh, and then you, you also use debt in that way, that the debt is owed to the caretakers rather than from the care, you know, from somehow some debt to society or debt to the market that would be the other way. So I just wanted to re-emphasize that as very inspirational and thank Martha again for, for both for the work, uh, which still inspires me and Ruth and Silly for, and everyone for, for the, uh, the occasion to talk about it. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, I, I think I speak uh, in both uh, Ruth and, and my own behalf uh, uh, in, in thanking you. And, and please uh, all join me in, in uh, thanking uh, Martha and Miranda for a truly inspirational uh, session. Thank you.